sorry. Christopher, sorry. Christopher, you're, you're muted. Sorry. You know, uh, let me start over. I guess I was muted there. Sorry about that. Sorry, sorry. Uh, this is uh, Christopher Kirby uh, with the NorCal um, Regional Association, and I want to welcome you today. Uh, we have an exciting program today um, dealing with a documentary, The West is Burning, and, uh, and a discussion about the topics contained there. Uh, essentially, the goal of the evening is to better educate EFs and the general public about sustainable forest management for a safer future so that we can reduce wildfires and support local communities. And let me, before we, um, uh, if you have on your screen a closed caption, you can turn that off um, as well. Uh, but let's get started here. I'm gonna tell you, uh, before I introduce the speakers, um, what's going to be happening today. We're gonna learn about the speakers and then we're gonna watch a clip. Uh, and then um, Melody and Nils are just gonna, discuss a number of um, topics, and then we're actually gonna have a Q&A. And I think uh, what we're planning to do is to um, use the unmute uh, button, or if you wanna raise your um, hand, that's, as, that's fine as well. Um, uh, so let me introduce our speakers, one of whom is a Williams grad. Uh, first is Melanie Parker, the Deputy Director of Sonoma County Regional Parks. And then there's Nils Christofferson, class of 1988. He um, is the director of the, I'm sorry, the executive director of Willowa uh, Resources, uh, which is a nonprofit in Eastern Oregon. And the organization works in youth education, land stewardship, natural resources management, and rural job creation. In addition to these topics, uh, Willowa Resources led to the creation of The West is Burning. Uh, Nils and his family moved to Wallowa County in 1999 to support Wallowa um, resources field programs. Nils had as a diverse experience in place-based natural resources management uh, from working around the world, including ranching in Australia, farming in Israel, fishing and forestry in Norway, and forestry and wild wildlife conver uh, conservation in Southern Africa. He's passionate about working landscapes and the role of rural communities in their stewardship. Uh, now, Niles, again, is a graduate of uh, Williams College uh, with a BA in economics, and then went on to Oxford University where he received an MS in forestry. And uh, Niles has served on many local and national boards, including the National Commission on Science for Sustainable Forestry, he currently serves on the Oregon Board uh, of Commissions, I'm sorry, Oregon Board of Forestry and World Center's uh, Board of Directors, and he's also served on the um, Enterprise uh, School District Board from 2004 through two 2017. And before we uh, start the panel itself, we're going to have a clip uh, uh, relating to the documentary, and uh, we're going to cue that up right now. aggressively and said Shirley get out here and um, I said what's going on Karen and she said Santa Rosa is burning down uh, I couldn't believe what I was seeing we got into the helicopter and it the winds were blowing 40 to 50 miles an hour. Um, there was smoke and fire everywhere. All I could do was look and say to Mike Thompson, our Congressman who had been in Vietnam, it looks like a war went on down there. It looks like a bomb. And he kept turning to me and saying, yeah, that's what it looks like, but it's actually worse. Hard to talk about still. Those first few days were so hard. We didn't sleep much. We worked all the time. The night of October 8th, we had a windstorm, and that windstorm led to 17 different fire starts across this landscape all around Santa Rosa. 
those 17 fires sort of rushed into each other and became two main large fire events. Stoplights were out, the power was out, people did not know which direction to go. It was really chaotic. There are close to about 20 fires that are scorching hundreds of thousands. Thousands of, of firefighters have been it's unable to across contain eight counties, wild. and hundreds more people Seven. are missing. It traveled 16 miles in an instant, it seemed like. It just came roaring over the hills. I've seen a lot Down of forest fires, but I had never seen anything like this before. It was, it was um, otherworldly. Some tech, Rob uh, may have some. Yeah, let me let me. Sorry if I, I mess, might have messed something up. Let me let me uh, sort this out real quick. Sorry. All right, so sorry, I don't know why the, the clips uh, didn't stream uh, one after the other, but let me, I got it queued up, so let me share again. Sorry about that. Has become, the wildfire issue has become intense in the United States, and it's gotten so much worse over the last 10 and 15 years, it's startling. We've had years and years of drought here in California, and there's no doubt it's gotten hotter and windier, and those conditions are, are ripe for wildfires, which now turn into urban fires, it turns out. There are more people in harm's way, and the harm is getting worse. So I think people are starting to realize that we have a crisis on our hands. I think it could very likely happen again here. That's part of the sadness of all of this, is that we all want to rebuild and recover. <sighs> and yet we still live with these tremendous risks. These wildfires are increasingly becoming an urban phenomenon. I mean, this, to me, you couldn't illustrate it more than this. We're not up in the hills. You know, we're in downtown Santa Rosa. The fire blew into Santa Rosa in the early morning hours. I think it was about 4 in the morning. I know people in this neighborhood who got the warning, looked out, saw a wall of flame, got in their car, escaped, and four minutes later, their house was on fire. So that's how rapidly the fire moved through here. Apologize, it's it's just not 
playing. Um, let me let me try one more. Fire is only one tool in the box, right? So one thing we're doing is trying to ramp up our sheep and goat grazing program, really get those critters out there browsing down the shrub layer. The second tool is mechanical treatment, you know, so going in there and hand cutting. But by far the cheapest tool in the box is prescribed fire. So to the degree to which we as land managers can get the public comfortable with prescribed fire, we'll be able to do a lot more acres for a lot fewer dollars, and that's kind of the goal. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you. Right, this is my daughter, Kira. Nice yeah, come on in. This is beautiful. Thank you so much. And Marty. Marty Roberts. Good to meet you. My goal tonight is to make sure that if you have any questions or you feel like you're going to get tough questions, I can help you answer them, right? So basically the, the ballot measure is roughly carved into three buckets. Safety, access, and then the third is my favorite because natural resources, so protecting the environment. And for everyone in this room, what I want you to understand is that this is a game changer for us. If we get this ballot measure, this little thing that I stood up called the Natural Resource Division at Sonoma County Regional Parks, which is mighty but small, will really be real. I mean, we will have the funds to do A lot of what I do project. is looking at these landscapes and trying to figure out how do we restore the natural process. Let's make sure that we get prescribed fire back in our toolbox in this part of the world, which is my goal because that actually draws down the fuel loads and helps protect our neighboring towns and communities. We're gonna have prescribed fire here at Sonoma County Regional Parks right here in Sonoma Valley. Pretty excited about that. Uh, it don't really feel safe by two o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> okay, so if it does get across that road down there, we'll have to pick that up just so we don't impact the Okay. The power poles. Yeah, hey, Cal Fire, you guys can integrate, you know, with the local government here. You guys don't have to hang out like <laughs> separate pockets. <laughs> now, also, we have an anticipated ignition sequence on the map shown by numbers and arrows. Steve and I will be communicating as he's at point A1, he's putting fire on the ground. Point A2, etc. Any questions so far? Pretty exciting! I didn't know what the shroud was for until the fire got lit. I was like, oh, it's to keep smoke out of your lungs. <laughs> it feels like the first ignition is kind of the iffiest because you just don't know. Because that's how I felt when you guys first ignited. Yeah. I was a little nervous because I was yeah. like, I don't know where this is going to go. Yeah. But then once you Maybe see the friend. <laughs> yeah, right? You just get into this like nonverbal communication and you're like in the flow and it's just a, it's an awesome feeling you just know that person needs water or that person needs you to scrape and uh, and you're not even talking you know we kind of had amnesia here in Sonoma County until all the fires of October 2017 and now we've woken up and we know that we have to have a little bit of smoke and controlled fire before we get a mega fire coming through here so it's really exciting to me we're turning the corner. I've known this girl since like elementary school, but we were never really friends. 
So when her house burned down, everyone was like, my condolences, like this is really sad and all of this. And my family was of course like, you know, do you need anything? Like, can we help you? And she was like, yeah, I want to live with you. And we were like, because we didn't know her that well or anything. She ended up being like the best friend I've ever had. And we kept going being like, man, this is crazy. Like this never would have happened if your house didn't burn down. All right, do you guys know what you'd like to order? All right, what can I have for you? Okay, back to you, Christopher. Christopher, are you there? Christopher. Okay. Well, I guess it's over to you, Nils and, and Melanie. I know you're going to get uh, started, you know, elaborating on the, uh, you know, the the topics that uh, you guys are going to discuss. That you know, sort of introduced there by the clips. So. Um, Amazing documentary, Nils. Thank you, Melanie, for all you've been doing uh, in Northern California to keep everyone safe. Uh, so take it away, please. All right, thanks. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and everybody. Uh, good to see some familiar faces and, and other Eves and friends. Um, when we organized this, uh, Vladimir suggested we might, Melanie and I might just touch on uh, four topics to get going. Um, the 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 history of fire suppression or how we have altered uh, natural fire and, and human fire on the landscape over time. Uh, the current thinking about forest restoration and sustainable forest management. Um, the role of fuel management and prescribed fire. And then uh, the, need, the need for capacity, both public private sector, community capacity, and political will to, to address this really significant challenge across the West. So Melanie and I thought we'd just have a little conversation about those topics um, to get started. And, and then I think uh, Chris is gonna help facilitate a little Q&A uh, after that. Um, and and I think and, and one of the things just so everybody knows is uh, Melanie used to work in Montana. That's where I met her. Uh, I think she's originally from Arizona, if, I, if my memory strikes. And uh, and um, we've had a great journey together working at within communities across the West, really thinking about um, community relationship to the land and how we rethink rural economies uh, as land stewards, um, and so the role of land stewardship to um, produce the products and services that society needs today and make sure in the process we're taking care of, of the soil and the water and the air and the wildlife at the same time. Um, and it's a real pleasure to have Melanie on board with this and she was a real star in this film. Uh, and I think obviously brings this story home to all of you in Northern California. So thanks for being with us, Melanie. You wanna kind of share some insights on fire suppression and how we started uh, changing fire regimes? Sure. I mean, I think what's interesting is in the film, the iconic imagery that you get for fire suppression is the slurry bomber, sort of modern, you know, uh, uh, fire services control of fire in the moment. But I think what's really important, and if you look at the lens of most of the landscapes in the American West, fire suppression actually began with removing indigenous peoples. So indigenous peoples used fire for thousands of years and, and many, many landscapes, including this one in Sonoma County, um, you would not have the assortment and arrangement of vegetation on the landscape as it is today if it were not for that. So you, you begin to suppress fires by removing people who were applying fire. Um, and then we also uh, removed agricultural use of fire. So for about 100, 120 years, ranchers in particular, you know, a lot of these lands were uh, Spanish and Mexican land grants, they were large ranchos, and, and, and then the, the, the settlers that came after them were routinely burning these landscapes in spring and fall. And so we, and then in the, you know, in the concern for air quality and, um, and modernization and people didn't want to breathe the smoke, 
so we, 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 we suppressed agricultural fires. Um, so, you know, we actually, there was some knowledge transfer uh, that occurred from indigenous times to uh, early settler times around the use of fire in these landscapes. And then we, uh, and then we came up with the 10 a.m. rule that the Forest Service implemented across the country, which was any fire start that started from lightning needed to be put out by 10 in the morning and very aggressively, which is the story that the film talks more about, um, have squelched fires and kept all lightning strikes to very small fires, except for when they become very big. Um, so fire suppression is a pretty uh, layered um, impact on our landscape. And there's a lot of pieces that have to be unwound to, uh, to get back into a historic or a, a balanced relationship with fire. To you, Nils. <laughs> All right. And I would just say one of, one of the things about the story, right, we're going to try to condense a lot of stuff into a little bit of time. And, and the West is a big place and there's a huge diversity of landscapes uh, uh, and, and plant communities and weather patterns. And all of that matters in the story. And, um, and, and there's no single answer uh, that is applicable across the West, but there's some general uh, learning and understanding about what's happening. And, and clearly that removal of fire from the landscape, uh, which in, in much of the West, um, except for the, the very wet coastal forest or high alpine forests, uh, change these forests from, from more of a mosaic of um, dense forest and open forest and meadow, um, but something that had a lot of what we call patchiness, a lot of pattern, um, it changed it from that to be more of a continuous forest. So you saw an expansion of both forest cover across the landscape, filling in meadows, filling in open areas, um, but also within that forest, more layers, more age classes and structure within that forest so that you, you had what we say today is, a, is an increased continuity of fuels horizontally across the landscape, but also vertically from the grass up to the crown. And all of that, that basically convey, creates this conveyor belt for fire so that instead of having more patchy, smaller scale fires with mixed effects, we tend to have more and more very large fires that we call mega fires uh, that, that are occurring with a greater proportion of high severity, high severe effects. And I'm being careful with the wor words again because that severity level, it changes all the time. It changes between day and night. It changes as the wind changes. It changes as it moves into different types of vegetation or even up and up and up a slope. And then as it tries to work its way back down a slope. Um, and so there's, you know, th there is still diversity in that, but there's, but we're experiencing when you, when they analyze it, we're seeing bigger and bigger high, uh, high severity fire effects across the landscape. And it, and it is made worse uh, by longer, hotter, drier summers uh, and changed wind events. Um, that you know are clearly attributed to, to climate change. Um, so, in response to all of that, you, you know, when I got to uh, Northeast Oregon in 1999, I had been working overseas for 13 years, um, including with communities in Southern Africa that were essentially trying to do the similar things we're trying to do in, in Eastern Oregon, which is sort of reimagine what rural economic development and rural prosperity looks like aligned with conservation goals rather than in opposition to conservation goals. And, um, and a key, you know, everybody could see the writing on the wall that, uh, that the, the forest management needed to change and, and, and whether people wanted it to change or were ready for it to change, it was changing because of uh, new species listed under the Endangered Species Act, a greater appreciation of, of forest ecosystems and how they function, um, a shift in, in the Forest Service and in, in managing for sustained yield to, uh, to what they call ecosystem management. Um, 
And there was this dramatic need to figure out how to manage the forest different for goals that were about wildfire risk reduction, improved forest health, providing the diversity of habitat for wildlife, and still and, and figuring out now how to be clever about using different, um, different raw materials coming off the forest rather than the biggest and the best trees as, as clear wood saw logs in the mills, figuring out how to use smaller trees. And, and, and we're getting good at it now with uh, engineered wood products and, and, and mass timber products. Uh, and even nanotechnology that's turning cellulose into windows and um, and you know a whole range of other products, clothing as well. Um, but but the focus really was from from going to sustain timber harvest to forest restoration, which meant um, a big shift uh, in technology, in in um, in skills, and then developing new markets. And Melanie, you saw that a lot with all the loss of industrial lands in, in Montana when I first met you. Yeah, and I was going to pick up on a slightly different thread, Nels, um, but I could circle back to that. I was just thinking, you know, this is a good time to call out um, you as an alum of Williams, because if you look at Wallawa Resources, what they successfully are doing and have done over the last 20 years is anticipate this trend and get ahead of it. So as contrast here in Sonoma County, you know, we have the film really talks about this issue of, you know, the tension between preserving nature and um, sort of exploiting nature and how so many of us for the last 30 years have been trying to find that sweet spot of like, where do we actually steward nature and utilize the byproducts of stewardship? And that's what a lot of resources has done is they've kept some of the the know-how in the community, as well as some of the businesses in the community, and been able to convert some of them into these wood products that are more uh, appropriate and more meeting the needs of our society right now. You contrast that to Sonoma County here, where we all but abolished the logging industry and haven't replaced it with anything. So as somebody who's a parks manager or an open space manager, I'm paying exorbitant amounts of money for people to come and remove these 80 year old Douglas firs out of the forest to restore the oak woodland, it's costing the taxpayer money that it shouldn't have to, right? Those, we should have markets for those products. So we're, we're actually playing, even though we're in the Bay Area and we're supposedly the progressive edge of you know, innovation, it's some of these places like uh, Northeastern uh, Oregon that have been ahead of this and sort of avoided their community you know, crashing through that situation. So that's one of my biggest challenges is just markets distance to markets and markets for product. And, and you and I both and, kind and, of, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say, you know, and you, you and I both sort of work through this transition of, um, of um, strong uh, growth uh, and appropriate outcry of the people about, um, sort of over harvesting, uh, there, there's no question that across uh, a lot of the West, um, the harvest rate exceeded the capacity of that forest to, to, sustain, um, to sustain the structure and the processes and diversity of habitats and roles that a forest ecosystem plays. Uh, and, and, it, and it created this break in trust to the Forest Service, which prior to that had been one of the most esteemed federal agencies in the United States for decades, um, recognized as real professionals at their job, super competent, a lot of pride, uh, and that that trust eroded. And, and our challenge working in communities, both as interface with county officials, um, forest products industry, uh, native tribes, federal agencies, environmental organizations was how do we how do we bring people back together, think creatively about applying what we know about the science and create some win wins that allow that put people back to work, uh, create value from those byproducts, but also rebuild trust. Um, and and that 
that's part and parcel of this whole notion of for, forest collaboration that's that's been building across the West. I don't know if you want to talk about that from Montana. Yeah, I mean, that's the work that I did for 20 years in Montana and, and the lessons I've tried to bring uh, here. And, and honestly, it was really hard at first um, when you live in a, in a scrappy rural place that's under-resourced, um, it's easier actually to get people to work together, even though we had our political divides and our cultural divides. Um, here in a regulatory framework, there's not a lot of incentive for people to work across a landscape. And I would say only in the last few years in Sonoma County have I started to see more of um, what I would call functional collaboration and also funding resources. For instance, we just got a settlement from the 2017 fires from PG&E um, that came to the county and, uh, and we were able to turn that into a granting program that literally said, if y'all work across boundaries together on landscape scales, you form collaboratives in micro watersheds or upper you know, headwaters watersheds, and you can show that you can take this money and leverage it across fence lines and across uh, private and public parcels, then you know, then you win. You get the you get the funding, and you um, and you get to tell the story of how you restored your watershed. And so that's really what this work takes, like Nils was saying, and it that takes relationships and trust building. And uh, it's not just you know taking a widget of science and applying it to a landscape. It takes people. So um, I didn't know we were going to talk about collaboration, but I'm happy to. <laughs> I think we should. Um, Keep moving through a couple more topics and then open it up to see what you all want to talk about. Um, let's see, our next one is fuels management and prescribed fire. Um, I would just say, I'll tell one tiny story and then hand it over to you, Nils. Um, I returned, I came to, I went to school at UC Santa Cruz, so I am not a, uh, and then University of Montana, so I, not a Williams grad, but I uh, had been gone from this landscape for a long time, and through much of that time, I had been doing this work in in the Northern Rockies. And so when I came back, one of the first questions I asked everyone is what are we doing about fire? You know, and, and what are we doing with prescribed fire? And what are we doing with fuels management? And uh, I was literally told, we don't have fire here. This is 2015, we don't have fire here. Now I could walk to any ridge and show you a fire scarred madrone tree or oak tree, but I was told there's no fire here because the last big fire was 1964. And, um, and don't talk to anybody about fire because you'll freak out all the neighbors of the parks and open spaces. Um, and so I, we went from there to 18 months later, you know, all hell breaking loose. Um, but the good news about all hell breaking loose and the reason I love the, the super burger cut at the end there with the, with the teenage, the adorable teenage girl is that, you know, through that crisis came the opportunity and now everyone is talking fuels management, everyone's talking prescribed fire, everyone's do, you know, um, getting into it. And I feel like people are seeing it in California, at least through the climate lens. And so, you know, with the, the recent bills that the governor signed last Friday, there's just more and more resources coming our way to really get ahead of some of these dynamics. So um, I feel like this, the story is pretty good in terms of the last two things Vladimir asked us to talk about, which is fuels management and sort of political will. But I just I just jump on that and say, you know, when we think about how how do we respond to the landscapes that confront us now and the fire risk that exists and the last estimate from the Forest Service that it, over 100 million acres of public land in the West is at has a high risk of catastrophic wildfire. Um, so that's the, you know. That's the majority of the public lands of the West that are in a high fire risk. And that's more acres than we can um, treat with any one tool. Uh, fire is the cheapest and most effective tool, both letting natural fire burn where it's safe to do so and using prescribed fire, um, particularly closer to communities, but using prescribed fire also where it's safe to do so, then we can, we can begin to change fuel profiles, fuel loads, uh, and reduce the risk of, of larger future fires. Again, breaking up that continuity of fuels. But because we've inherited this much thicker, denser, more extensive forest, we have to do mechanical treatment as well. 
because it's too dangerous to allow either a lightning fire or prescribed fire to go into many places that are at the highest risk, that at the highest risk of um, becoming a crown fire, becoming a, a stand replacing fire. And so we need to be using all of those tools, but prescribed fire, particularly in the shoulder seasons, even, even sometimes when there's still snow on the landscape, uh, which is what we now understand uh, the Native Americans did. As, you know, they started burning patches when it was safe to do so because there was still snow around. Um, that early season and late season prescribed burning when it's wetter and un unlikely to go, we need to do more of that and we need to figure out when and how to do that in a way that doesn't cause health problems from the smoke. Um, but that alone isn't going to get us out of the problem. We also need to have we need to understand the importance of doing the thinning, the mechanical treatment uh, to reduce these heavy fuel loads and, um, and engage with the communities and the Forest Service and the other people that are trying to do that and rebuild the trust and the confidence that we are applying the science right. We are doing restoration. This isn't just cutting trees um, in, in the name of a fire as a way to get saw logs out. Um, it, it's, it, it is, this is really responding to the fire risk. So all those, all those tools are needed, it, including, as I said, letting, particularly in the wilderness, letting, um, lightning fires burn where it's safe to do so, um, which, which isn't everywhere. And then, you know, we get to the political will and, and the funding and, and funding alone doesn't solve the problem. Your governor and legislature have done an incredible Step recently in allocating an incredible amount of money, um, over $500 million, if my memory strikes me, to respond to this problem. Uh, no other state has come close to committing that much money to this problem, but money alone doesn't solve it. It's people on the ground that do the work. Um, and we've seen this real loss across the West of, of public sector, private sector, community capacity to do forest management and, and prescribed fire work. Uh, and we need to rebuild that capacity uh, to get this job done. Melanie, there's a question Mark, in the I chat. See, Mark, I see your question, and I'm not going to be able to pull numbers out, out of my head right now, but I will get them for you since you're here in Santa Rosa. I mean, most recently, I signed a, a check for $80,000 for a, just a roadside fuel management project on Pythian Road that wasn't that wasn't that technical. So, but I'd have to break it down like per acre cost for you. It's crazy. Um, yeah, feel free to use the chat function. I was gonna uh, stem off that. One of the things, speaking of that, Nils, labor is a real issue. So one, another constraint for us for sure is just, um, people to work in the woods, whether that's, you know, CCC type crews or, uh, uh, you know, registered uh, professional foresters, which we require here in the state of California. Um, we every class of people that work in the woods are, um, we, we have a shortage of, so we just put some money, some of the pg and &E settlement money to the local junior college to build out um, a major program and training folks for this work. And that will, that has a three to five year lag time. So that's definitely a, a huge constraint. You know, you could throw all the money at us in the world and we still wouldn't be able to get all the work done. So, so th th this is Rob, sorry, let me just, just interject. Um, so Joe, uh, sorry to cut you off there, but uh, let's say people have the ability to unmute and ask questions. So if you wanna raise your hand, like we can, we can certainly go one at a time. Uh, happy to run through a variety of topics. Looks like, and feel free to use the chat as well. Um, so, Joe, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, thanks, uh, Melanie. I just wanted to follow up on what you were saying about needing the people to actually do the work, and you know, as you talked about that as well. Um, there's obviously there's like a training component, but um, and I think you said it takes like three to five years, but What's the, um, how do we get more people interested in doing this work, I guess? Like, there's the thing about like, actually training them up when they have interest, but um, was there, and maybe it goes back, Neil, to what you said about like the US Forest Service and how it used to be a place where 
people had pride in working and some of that has changed over time, but what are some longer term things that have to be do with what's taught in school or like what's the feeder for this, you know, capacity over time? Um, you know, I mean, I don't know that there's a simple solution to it, but one is to sort of um, rebuild a, a sense of opportunity and value and, and certainly in rural places, a, a sense of, of dignity uh, in doing this job and not make it seem like, you know, forestry is, is dirty or bad. Um, or a dying industry, because certainly that that was the narrative when I came back from Africa to Northeast Oregon. Um, you know that it the narrative was it's a dying industry and was taking a lot of uh, public criticism, um, and that's not a place that parents you know encourage their kids to pursue, <laughs> and so. Uh, you know, that's part of it. The other part is this from a private sector point of view is just um, confidence that we're not just going through some fad or some blip or that, you know, like this infrastructure bill might pump some money to get some work done for five or six years, but it's it doesn't have 20, 30 years, the, the, the amount of time you'd want to invest to start a company or buy new equipment. Uh, or really invest in in training and developing uh, a, a long term workforce, and so we need we need to have confidence that whatever forestry looks like today, and 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 it and it looks like a lot of different things. Um, that more people, more kids in high school and in college, uh, and 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 those out of school tr still trying to figure out what they want to do, like like I did when I left Williams. That they that they understand sort of the breadth of opportunity that's there and get excited by it and and have people to connect to and and really importantly that there are those local businesses whether they're for profit or non profit um, that um, you see a, see a sustained future in this work. Yeah, and um, uh, because I'm not his dad, I'm going to answer Nikolai's. Uh, <laughs> questions posted in the chat here, or at least attempt to. Um, I think the first thing you put there, Nikolai, is really thought provoking in the sense that it's not just the erosion of trust in the federal government and rural communities, but sort of the overall erosion and trust in all things government right now that is not helping any of this. Um, so I think that's really spot on. I feel fortunate to work in county government where at least you can have those personal relationships it's sort of like working in a rural community in the sense that you can overcome that barrier but you know how people feel about our state government we just our governor governor narrowly you know survived his recall um, and certainly how people feel about the federal government it really matters for these issues that we're talking about so restoring you know strategies that restore and regain that kind of, of that kind of trust and then in terms of legislative solutions, uh, one thing I was involved in last week uh, with the, the climate bills that were um, passed on Friday is there's um, there's language in there and, and Nils and I worked on some similar things with, um, with NEPA, but this is with CEQA. So in California, we have the California Environmental Quality Act. And so not only things done on public lands, but things done with public monies have to go through a pretty intense environmental review, like environmental impact report. So they they actually, the legislature just wrote into those bills, some exemptions for forest restoration, for habitat improvement projects, um, trying to streamline some of that CEQA, not to get rid of it, to obvi you know, obviate not to not follow the environmental law, but for these really um, critical issues where we can make a lot of good quickly um, uh, some sort of nuances. So there's lots of ways to kind of get in there and figure out what is the exact problem that people are having. Oh, Seek was really expensive and it's taking too long and it's not adding as much value. What if we just, uh, you know, we, um, we advised with uh, Fish and Wildlife and if Fish and Wildlife signs off on it, then we're good to go. So those kinds of solutions are really fun to work on. Uh, we have a question from Miles um, Horton, who's the class of uh, 15. He says, one quick, quick question I had about the 
um, the ranchers, um, about how the ranchers used to burn rain, range lands uh, regularly, but no longer do so. What would it take to get that going again? Would air quality rules need to change or are there other factors involved? Is this really Miles Horton? Because I remember <laughs> Miles Horton from the Highlander Institute. No, that would have been like 1915, though, not 2015. Um, uh, a great question. Um, uh, yes, it basically, it's mostly air quality. So um, we are working with uh, air quality regulators in the Bay Area to create flexibilities um, and more burn burn windows um, for, for ranchers and for everyone else. So yeah, that's and the that's main constraint. Yeah, and, and when I, uh, we, we actually got new smoke management allowances passed through the state of Oregon uh, last year that um, still keep us within the EPA clean air guidelines, um, but provide some latitude for some smoke. Um, and as long as there's a good community coordination and communication so that everybody is aware of uh, that this is happening and that there's some plans and support put in place for the people that are most vulnerable to uh, to smoke. Um, and, and that's a key thing. The other thing I would just add is there's always been a liability issue. Um, smoke, at, even as uh, that clip from Melanie, when she talks to the guy from Cal Fire and he admits that he wasn't really certain what was gonna happen after they ignited it. I mean, that's the reality of playing with fire. Um, and and the liability of losing control of a fire is is pretty serious, and so that's also been been a concern um, that uh, people are working on. Um, I could um, I know. Let me interrupt, um, William Carney. You've had your hand up for quite a while, so I'm going to um, call on you there to pose your question. Okay. Hi. Um, Thanks for this uh, presentation. And I appreciate that both of you have uh, uh, made the connection to climate change. And my question is, um, could you expand some on the connection between what you're doing with treatment for fire prevention, which is basically an adaption or preparation for climate impacts, uh, but the connection of that to the possibilities of uh, mitigation or actually addressing the causes um, of climate change, for instance, by greater forest health for sequestration, uh, or what do you do with the stuff once you cut it uh, so that it's handled in a way that, um, you know, is carbon responsible. Thanks very much. I think I'll take grasslands and Nils, you can take woodlands. Um, one thing we're doing is, uh, you know, most of the grasslands in this part of California have been replaced uh, the native grasslands have been replaced by uh, European annual non-native grasses that are not very deep rooted. Uh, and so one of the things we're doing is restoring grasslands uh, to more perennial systems that are more deep rooted and sequester more carbon per acre, quite, uh, quite a bit more carbon. So that's one of the initiatives that we're, uh, we're undertaking right now. And the, and the forest, Rest, forest management, restoration, forest fire, carbon debate is, or even our understanding of that is, um, is still evolving and growing. Um, I think uh, at a at a very simple level, um, you have people that have. Um, um, there's there are certainly. Uh, there's challenges because a lot of the national discussion about forests and carbon um, are driven by some actions on the East Coast uh, that are very, very different than what we're dealing with in the West. Um, and in the West, where there's an opportunity to reduce emissions from wildfire uh, and also reduce emissions from slash pile burning, and try to convert as much of that material into products that we can, in often long lasting durable products uh, that we can use within the, within the United States mostly uh, and, and offset um, the energy 
use to produce some competing product or or to to import that product from someplace else. Um, there's a pretty pretty solid argument to be made in in favor of doing that forest restoration, uh, it, improving the productivity and and therefore the sequestration of carbon on site, reducing the emissions uh, from wildfire or slash pile burning. Uh, and as I said, producing some durable products that that reduce carbon um, budgets related to any any substitute for that product. But but it's complicated, um, and and we're still sort of getting a better understanding of where the carbon is st stored below ground, above ground, um, and and how old growth forests. Uh, capture and store carbon over the long term versus younger forests. Um, the most compelling data and science that I saw came out of British Columbia, and, and it really tries to distinguish between um, the storage of carbon, so carbon stocks, and ongoing carbon sequestration. Um, and there was clearly across British Columbia this um, period where sequestration was increasing and carbon stocks storage was increasing. But then when the mountain pine beetle hit, uh, because essentially they had exceeded the carbon storage capacity, that would be one way to look at it, uh, of that landscape, uh, mountain pine beetle hit and then fires hit. And now you've seen this significant loss in carbon stocks across the landscape as well as a, as a reduction in um, in new sequestration. And so it's complicated, but I do think, uh, but we're thinking about it. There's a lot of time and energy being thought and debated in, in peer reviewed science and, and other, and, and in the field. Um, and we're trying to figure out um, how do we align uh, our forest management and restoration goals so that we're contributing, we're at least not worsening uh, the carbon budgets. Hopefully, we're contributing to to mitigating climate change, and I think we can. Um, but but it's not a definitive. I can't give you a definitive answer right now. Um, there's Mills, one... do you want to say just one? Oh, go ahead, Christopher. Sorry. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Oh, there was one other question about um, you know entrepreneurs and what other examples that you might have of, of products and businesses that are filling filling this gap. Do you want to give a couple of other examples just from your own work or from Oregon based uh, work? Sure. You know what the I mean the very when I the one of the very first things that people ask well, our resources to do when I got here in 1999 was to find new markets and figure out how to put people to work using small diameter trees and, and converting into some sort of products. Um, and um, there's a whole range of products you can do. They don't all have big enough markets to, to uh, match the scale of the raw material that would be coming in. Um, and they also tend to be, um, uh, dynamic markets, they go through pretty big swings in, in, in prices. So it makes it difficult to build a business plan around that. Uh, we worked hard with a bunch of people to create what we call the, a, an integrated biomass campus model that allows for anything that is not a commercial saw log um, to come to one facility and be sorted and processed into a range of products, none of them very uh, exciting, uh, but a range of highest and best value products, and therefore um, turn what is typically a liability, uh, a cost on the landscape, at, at least into a break-even proposition, and 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 sometimes it even ends up paying the landowner um, some marginal amount of, of money per ton uh, for that to, to remove uh, the 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 trees that are are putting that landscape most at risk, both from insects, pests, but also fire. Um, and that range of products, like the most important one right now for us is hop poles. The Yakima Valley in Washington is like produces 40% of the world's hops um, and small diameter trees, four to five inch, five to six inch trees. 
make great hot poles. Um, but we also were like the third largest bundled firewood producer in the West. We heat treat the firewood uh, to reduce the risk of transporting forest insects. Um, and we produce a range of residuals that are going into um, cardboard and paper manufacturing. So that's kind of a that's kind of a bottom feeder. Like it's an innovative approach to dealing with really low value products. At the higher end is a lot of work going into uh, cross laminated timber and and trying to prove that a technology that works with commercial saw logs would also work with smaller diameter wood, including um, species like ponderosa pine that have different resins that sometimes make that lamination a little more challenging. Um, and 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 I, uh, you may be aware of sort of um, cross laminated timber being part of a new push to build um, tall buildings out of wood. Um, and that's a great way to store carbon and, and, and generate a lot of value back to pay for the forest restoration work. Um, we have one last question that I'm gonna pose to you and it's by Katie Breckenridge and it's probably a fairly large topic, but <laughs> she asked about the politics against the solutions that you recommend and what happened or can be done to shift those politics. So again, that's probably a big question, but uh, um, we'll close on that. Well, I'm glad you caught it because Katie and I were in the same entry. So it was great. <laughs> Good to see you again, Katie. Uh, but, you know, it, you know, I, I, we mentioned, both Mel and I mentioned kind of this breakdown in trust and um, these, this, the, you know, certainly through the 90s, there was this competing timber war narrative of use it, you know, people that were very much pro-use and wanting to sustain the existing industries, which had been really important to a lot of the rural West and, and those that were very concerned that um, that old model, um, you know, had over, you know, had abused the forest that had taken more than it should have. And, uh, and, and the time was really there to, to protect and preserve the forest. And it led in 1996, 97 to the Sierra Club to, to establish a platform against any commercial harvest of, on uh, national forest system lands. And, and I referenced that just because some of the people that were involved in creating that platform for the Sierra Club are leading voices today that continue to um, to question uh, whether the forest restoration work that is being promoted and in, in which I think the vast majority of uh, organizations and scientists, universities, community people, even you know, everybody I work with agree that we need to do it, but there is this strong, uh, respected group of conservation, envi you know, environmental leaders that continue to question it, um, essentially because they, you know, they don't trust us and they don't trust the science and, and, um, and have a different vision for the public lands of the West. Um, and and we're you know we we got to figure out how to work our way through that. I don't know, Melanie. Yeah, can you and help I mean me I think a big part of a big part of the answer is you know folks like Nils and I have to be clear that bad stuff happens out there and we don't support bad stuff, right? There's bad actors, whether it's an industry or a private landowner or or an agency, um, but we need to hold up our own projects as examples and then really I think walking people through the landscape. There's no um, substitute for, I mean, I could take you right now up onto Hood Mountain and show you places that because of the fuel breaks we put in and because of the dug fur we removed, we have healthy oaks and we can walk right across the way and we can see where the canopy fire caught all the 400 year old oaks and they're gone. Um, and so, you know, the, just walking people through these, these narratives of, uh, that are actually written on the landscape so that you can read and interpret what's happening in real time that really helps. And then just doing demonstration projects and really championing them, whether it's through the media, social media, stories, films, whatever, um, and building trust that way because people, right now we have a drum roll of folks that are following a particular sort of 
litany of science that you know all fuels management is is suspect um and the thing is people get gripped by fear and fear of the unknown and so you have to show them what the knowns are and 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 walk back their fear and recalibrate it so we do a lot of that work and that's that's soft skills work and that's that's the only thing that really helps honestly uh, Nils and Melanie, we want to thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, and of course, our NorCal audience. Um, and uh, Rob has just put up the next uh, event. I, we, we do in NorCal hope that you are enjoying the uh, events. But um, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. Yes, Nils, thank you. Thank you. This is wonderful. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, Christopher, thanks for organizing and, and emceeing. Um, and everybody, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's an amazing discussion. Uh, please stay on top of it. You know, it's certainly from the East Coast, we hate to see, uh, you know, the news and, and, and what, what's been going on with the Northern California and elsewhere. Um, and so well, we hope you, you keep working on this and, and, and uh, sort it out. That's what uh, we all, we're all hoping for a solution. So thanks again. Thanks so much. Thanks, all. Bye now. Bye.